agitation around a busy metropolitan airport. The first thing you learn is that it takes a lot of people to make it work. Another thing you learn is that many of the men who make it all so safe and apparently simple are never seen or recognized by the passengers. But they're there. The FAA airway facility men, sharing responsibility for every flight we make. Serving an area of over 250,000 square miles, the Kansas City Air Route Traffic Control Center guides and separates aircraft 24 hours a day in all kinds of weather. For that guidance, each pilot depends upon a small group of men seated thousands of feet below, presiding over a network of radar and complex electronic gear. Here in this control room, these specialists control the planes in the area as well as those entering and leaving. Through them flows an endless stream of information, important information to a pilot. CWA 100, loud and clear. Navy 44847, say again. Roger, I'm leveling at 6,000. Radar registers each plane's location as a blip on the controller's scope, allowing the controllers to maintain a safe separation between all aircraft flying under instrument flight rules in his sector. Our equipment is complex, and they must depend on it. For their work allows no margin for error. But a machine is only as good as the men who built it and maintain it. The responsibility for maintaining that air traffic control equipment belongs to the Airway Facilities Sector Chief, Bob Shadowan, and his staff. The technicians and mechanics on Shadowan's staff are responsible for a fantastic array of equipment valued at more than $2 million. And whether modifying a radar display or checking any of the intricate subsystems, each man knows his job is a crucial one. 
Men like this are trained to cast a critical eye on every piece of equipment. Always on the lookout for the first sign of a component that may need replacement. Backing them up, Shadowan staff has a wide array of safeguards built into this control center. Monitors, alarms, standby equipment. Systems maintenance is as complex and varied as the equipment itself. There are over 130 specialties, each one requiring special training. In millionths of a second, the contact signal from a long-range radar flashes up to a microwave terminal, then through a series of repeaters, every 25 or 30 miles to the control center, and finally to the control room. The expression, check and double check, applies to this man. He is monitoring reports from technicians at a series of microwave relay stations. They are checking in with a report that the stations at Peabody, at Clemens, and at Harveyville are doing the job of reflecting and transmitting radar signals. With all this electronic gear, power is so all-important that the center is backed up by a standby generator system. If the center loses its commercial power during a storm, it can transfer the load for the entire center without losing surface. This is only one of the 20 mainland FAA air route traffic control centers, all serviced by the men in airway facilities. of flights bring tourists to Puerto Rico every month, and most of the traffic is handled by a small network of radar and navigational equipment that is spread out across the island. The location of some of those sites can lead an FAA man to some strange and inaccessible places. Reuben Powell is driving toward a place where the sun seldom shines, Pico del Este. Here the FAA maintains two radar systems. Reuben is used to the arduous trip. The radar site lies above a heavy rain forest. There's a simple explanation as to how such a forest earns its name. It rains almost every day, and suddenly. Pico del Este is over 3,500 feet high and the long-range radar site is always in the clouds. Reuben's tour of duty here will be three days. Detection. Finding that link in the chain of equipment that might fail is the more glamorous part of Reuben's work but he knows that day-to-day -day maintenance and repair is just as important. Working with him is Marcial Rosario, one of several island-born Puerto Ricans that work here for the FAA. This tube has failed, but the backup equipment has already taken over with no loss of surface. In aviation, a man's training is never really finished. Many regularly return to school or study on their own. Reuben is from Oakland, California, and during his off hours, he is completing an engineering degree from the University of California. Other men either take correspondence courses or attend FAA schools. This is a Navy height finder radar, similar to the ones used by civilian aircraft. At an opportune time during its work cycle, Reuben makes an adjustment of the azimuth and elevation data transmission. There is no break in the radar's operation, so 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, this fogged-in castle lends a hand to the island in the sun below. facility men lead pretty normal lives, but things are a little different for Terry Jacobs. He is an island commuter. 
along with his companion, Reed Butler. puts islands in some inconvenient places. Man-made islands are usually more conveniently situated, but in this case, the island is a Vortac facility and its location was dictated by established air traffic patterns. This Vortac site is one of a chain of radio navigation installations which allows pilots to follow one of many discrete radio beams to or from a fixed point on the ground. In this case, the ground is Lake Pontchartrain. On days like this, going to work can be pretty nice. But on other days, nature just doesn't cooperate. Lake Pontchartrain can turn on and be as tough and mean as any piece of water there is. On those days, even to a native like Jacobs, this kind of going to work is rugged. signals that originate here tell the pilot how far he is from the ground station along his chosen path. Once Jacobs has made it inside, he first checks the TACAN portion of the equipment. The instruments show there's something wrong with the distance measuring system, but there's been no interruption in service. Like most FAA navigational aids, it automatically switches over to a standby. With an oscilloscope, Terry finds the trouble. Within a short time, he isolates the problem in the complex monitor and begins to correct it. Once again, electric power is the key to this sophisticated gear. And again, a backup generator system must be checked by Butler to make certain that this island won't go off the air. finished, Terry and Reed will start their unorthodox commuter trip back to the mainland, confident that their island is ship once again. This is Squaw Valley, California, site of the 1960 Winter Olympic Games, now one of the fabulous ski areas in the West. The area around Squaw Peak is also flying country, and therefore another site for a vortex. Just as at New Orleans, this VOR emits a radio signal which, when received by a suitably equipped plane, enables the pilot to stay on course. An aerial navigation map locates the VOR on the ground and gives its frequency. When the receiver is set to that frequency, an indicator needle tells whether he is on course or flying to the left or right of it. It also tells him whether he is going to or from the VOR. Down on the ground, there are men whose job it is to make sure the input to that needle is correct. Squaw Valley may be a vacation paradise to most skiers, but to Harwin Feemster, it's part of his regular beat. An experienced and duly certified FAA technician, Har maintains a VOR facility 8,900 feet above sea level. Most men find it hard enough to be on time for the 815 train or even the carpool. Har's trek to his job is a bit more complicated 
before he's finished, he'll be using a pair of government-issued skis and poles, and some skills not required of every FAA man. On this assignment, his reward is the kind of scenery that few of us glimpse on the way to work. the gondola, he skis a short distance to a chairlift that goes to a ski area known as Siberia. The easy part of this trip is coming to an end. But for a Texan from Alaska, climate just isn't the challenge. During his career with the FAA, Har has gone to work on everything from a horse to a seaplane. From the top of the chairlift, it's not too far to the entrance hut. But the wind sometimes reach over 100 miles an hour, and storms can leave up to 20 feet of snow. The weather on Squaw Peak has proved so hazardous that to enable its men to reach the VOR safely, FAA built a tunnel in the sky, 1,400 feet long. Inside the facility, there's not much resemblance to the world of resort life. It's furnished to meet the likely threat of long stays during bad weather. It's a compact world of electronic equipment, which reaches straight up through its tower to the sky with a constant message, which must be right. Fire the day passes quickly for heart. The equipment is all familiar, much of the work routine, even repetitive. But every component is important, and what was right yesterday could be wrong today. By making performance checks and by checking the meter readings, Har can tell whether there have been any abnormal changes. If so, he takes corrective action. Anyone involved in facility maintenance must have patience, and a strong sense of responsibility. There's no one looking over your shoulder if you decide to take a shortcut or put off checking a piece of equipment till next time. The FAA chooses the kind of men who just won't risk shortcuts when the risk is someone else's. used to bad weather, but it's a difficult task getting back down off the ridge in a 50-mile wind. Har may not have the kind of form that wins at the Olympics, but he has what it takes to handle the assignment. In fact, for him, getting back from Siberia is all part of a day's work. Jets or passenger liners coming in at Old Town, Maine. The lakes and the local airstrip are used by pilots flying their own planes, but there's plenty of traffic. Of the 120,000 or more civil aircraft flying in the United States, only a few thousand belong to big passenger carriers. The rest are general aviation aircraft. Not all FAA installations are gleaming new communication centers nor are all of them located in exotic or inaccessible locales. But even in the most modest flight service station, there's important work being done. There are hundreds of these stations across the nation, in busy metropolitan airports and at quiet outposts like this. Pilots go to a flight service station to submit flight plans and to get information and advice. 
the number one item he's concerned about is weather. The staff here provides pre-flight and in-flight service to any pilot who requests it. Emergency services to aircraft in difficulty, airport advisory service, reports of aircraft movement, and weather reports, which keep pouring in on the busy teletypewriters. Communicating information and monitoring electronic navigation aids is the business of the flight service station. So Phil McGill is kept busy making sure that radio and teletypewriter equipment are in good repair and that there is no loss of communication or service. In the age of electronics, these men know the importance of the humblest piece of equipment. There could be a human life depending on it. The equipment here is not so glamorous but it's important to the pilots, and therefore to the staff of the station. Outside, Duke Duquette checks the dew cell of the station's high-growth thermometer. It measures humidity, which can affect a plane's ability to perform under certain conditions. On a beautiful day like this, weather information may not seem too important to the pilots around Old Town, but the men who keep that information coming are there on the good days and the bad. Washington's Dulles International will clear scores of planes in the next hours. Scores of planes and Jim Walker. Jim crosses the runways and taxiways swiftly and unobtrusively. He has made this trip a thousand times. As an airway facilities technician, Jim Walker knows all about radar and communications equipment, but he specializes in air navigation aids. Jim is an old timer at Dulles. He was here before the airport opened in 1962. Right now he's headed for the waveguide localizer situated at the end of this runway. Radio equipment in another building transmits a signal which tells the pilot whether he is coming in too high or too low. It's all part of the instrument landing system. The localizer transmitting and monitoring equipment are housed in this unimpressive little building. The localizer signals tell a pilot whether he is approaching on course or to the left or right of course. The changes in this kind of equipment are usually small, sometimes subtle but they're kept up with care by men like Jim Walker. The people at Dulles know he does his homework. With his banjo, Jim Walker heads for the waveguide localizer. The banjo is a portable field detector for the localizer system. Jim employs it to measure and evaluate the radio signals. Most people would get nervous if they were even on the same runway with a jet. But Jim knows the pilots and the equipment which guides them in. He's not worried. Even in the electronic era, there are a lot of nuts and bolts and nails, and there's a lot of steel and wood and concrete and paint holding the whole business together and keeping the network working flawlessly. Wherever there's an installation, there's an airway facility man. The equipment at Dulles is usually the latest in hardware, sophisticated and subject to frequent modifications. Keeping abreast of the technology is a day-in, day-out task for Jim and the other men in his unit. They have minds that are naturally systematic. But men like Jim still find change exhilarating and challenging. Most days bring something new. 
But all of these men have trained themselves to treat the most routine inspection and tests as if they were a first-time experience. Dusk and the end of Jim's day. Though the landing light system is the responsibility of others, he gives it an extra check on his way home. These elaborate approach light systems have come a long way from the day when airports were lit by nothing more than feeble kerosene flares. Then the pilot and his passengers had little or no ground aids to rely on, and only a few dedicated men to maintain them. It's all much different now. There's a legion of men and equipment behind every takeoff, every flight, every landing. And there's never any question whether those lights and other aids will be operating tonight and tomorrow night. There are men working down there, making sure of that. Working from the ground up. <laughs> 